Welcome to the Holistic Wealth Podcast. I'm your host, Keisha Blair, wife, mother of three, author of Holistic Wealth, and founder of the Institute on Holistic Wealth. The show will showcase various experts in the key pillars of holistic wealth. Each week, we deliver the best information on how to become holistically wealthy and live your best life. Today, we have a very, very special guest with us. We have Jesse Draper, and Jesse is the founder of College Ventures. She's a venture capitalist, and you might remember her from her days on Valley Girl TV show. Jesse, it's great to have you here on the show. We're finally getting a chance to connect. So I'm glad about that. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Absolutely. And so I just wanted to get started with asking you about how you got started in this field and especially for women. So venture capital for women and just your journey around that. And so what was the impetus for that? Ooh, I mean, it was a long convoluted path, but it should have been more direct potentially because I grew up in Silicon Valley when it was less sort of Hollywoodized and celebrated. I am a fourth generation venture capitalist, which I share because I think it's an important part of my story. Everyone came from a different place, but because I was the first female in line, I didn't think I was allowed to like go into the business that my dad had been in. So I actually, you know, they say you can be what you can see. And I could see that my mom worked really hard raising four children. My aunt was an actress. And so I thought, oh, well, that's what women do. I mean, as an eight-year-old, you're kind of like, that's what you see. So I went, I was like hyper-focused on anything I did. And I was hyper-focused that I was going to be an actress. I went to UCLA School of Theater, Film and Television And, you know, simultaneously, my dad's sort of in the back of my head saying, let's take some business programs. Like, let's like make sure you're thinking about things as a business. I had some success in acting. I was on a Nickelodeon show, did a couple movies and was always auditioning, working really hard. And I was like auditioning one hiatus from the Nickelodeon show. And I went to just like a really dehumanizing audition. And I simultaneously was invited to this like first Twitter conference. It was like 2008. I was in LA and I went and I just remember looking around being like, this is a community that I understand while I'm one of the only females in the room. This is interesting to me. And it was like the early Twitters and tweet tweeters and whatever. And I I kind of wanted to like celebrate the people in technology. And so I created my tech talk show that you mentioned, The Valley Girl Show, ran that for five years, was nominated for an Emmy. Um, and it was really the first tech talk show, you know, like no one cared. And I had these incredible guests and it was like before you saw Elon Musk on the cover of magazines. I had Elon Musk on the show and it was just fascinating. Man, if I had invested in my guests, then I would be really just like doing great. I'm doing well. But it's like, it just, I would have had a real head start there. <laughs> I'm about 10 of them went public this year. I mean, it's great. Um, but anyway, for two seasons, I interviewed men in technology and I realized I was facilitating this problem I had felt. And so I did five seasons of the show. And after those two first seasons, I made an initiative to interview 50% women in tech. And I call it the Batwoman signal. They came in troves. It was like hundreds of women were pitching me because there was no place for women in tech. And so a lot of these fashion tech companies were just bubbling up like Rent the Runway and the Guilt Group. And it was a really interesting time. But I would first I was helping them get funding. I'd say you're a little early for the show sometimes, like maybe I can help you find funding. And then I started negotiating some sweat equity. And then I became a bit of an angel investor and would just write tiny checks. And some of those deals did really well for me. So I created this nice little portfolio. I would have continued with the show, but it was at a time when media was so incredibly broken. As an entrepreneur, we were barely breaking even. CBS still owes me money today. And I look at it. So CBS, feel free to give me a call. You know, it was just a broken industry. And I sort of was like, I can't go raise capital. I know this business too well. And like, if I did, I just don't see the outcome right now. But had I stuck with it, I'm sure as media's changed, it was, you know, hindsight's 2020. Um, I would have been doing fine, I'm sure. I think in the back of my head, maybe I knew I would go raise a fund, but it was like an identity crisis, you know? Like, I really felt like, uh, no, but I'm a woman. And so I just kind of went out. My husband's like, your angel investments are doing really, really 
well. I just want to put that out. And so I went, I pitched 500 potential investors, starting with a lot of the guests from my show. And a lot of them invested, but I closed 50 out of about 500 and raised my first 10 million. And we now manage about 50 million assets under management. We have 70 companies. We've made over 100 investments. And we're continuing to invest in women. So there has to be a female on the founding team of five. I have an incredible team, support team who works with me now. Can't do anything alone. I think it's always important to share. That's where we are today. So it was convoluted, not your typical journey, because I went kind of from actress to investor. But I mean, no one's is a straight line. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's a wonderful story. And you have some amazing companies in the portfolio, some of them that I admire very much. And I remember the early days, like, for instance, when Rent the Runway launched and the Skim and, you know, signing up for their Skim newsletter and Guild Group. So I think we've all kind of like grown with some of these companies and it's amazing to see them grow and just go public, as you mentioned earlier. So Jesse, you wrote an article on Medium, which went viral, and it was about investing in women not being a charity. There was a specific section of the article where you mentioned older men at an investment event, and they were openly, you know, drunk. Some of them were racing off to hotels with, you know, various prostitutes, things like that. And it's amazing because you mentioned in the article that some of them actually booked those same prostitutes at the table that you were sitting with some of those men at the same event, which is unbelievable. It's shocking to me for sure. You know, upon reading it, I was just like, really, this is this is unbelievable. How often does this happen in the investment VC world? And what were your thoughts on that? I mean, I can't just imagine in that moment, but how often does this happen? And what was going through your head at that point? Well, I think I'm at that point, you know, I'm pretty naive, I think. And I was like not thinking that's what was happening. And a lot of the pieces I sort of put together, like it took me a minute because they were referring to it differently. And it was just a weird situation. It was, I had heard stories like this before this happened. And by the way, this was fairly recently. It was only a couple of years ago. And I was one of two women at a dinner and one of my investors had called me and said, hey, there's going to be a bunch of millionaires, billionaires at this dinner. You should come pitch them. And that does not happen. I don't know about you, but that doesn't happen to me every day. So I like was like, I will be there. I will figure out how to be there. And I went and it was, yeah, it was disgusting. It was disgusting. Like they'd all gotten off the golf course. They were all drunk. They were high. They were talking about how they were high. They were I don't know. It just made me feel really icky. They were kind of like speaking in code. And then I realized what they were doing was talking about how they were booking these prostitutes for when they were about to leave. And I just, I had heard stories like that. I'd heard more stories like, oh, at, you know, this particular venture capital firm's Christmas party, they brought in a whole bunch of escorts, you know, at 10 p.m. or whatever, after like most of the the women had gone home or whatever. And um, I'd heard more stories like that. This was just, I was like, whoa, this happened? Like this happened in a major city in America? Like this is crazy. And so it kind of took me a minute. I, I think what I was thinking was like, what's happening? What are they talking about? What are they talking about? And you start putting the pieces together and you're like, broke. And it was winding down anyway. And I was as polite as I could be and just kind of, you know, pieced out. But, you know, and then my investor's like, did you follow up with them? Did you follow up with them? And I am, if nothing, I am dependable. And I followed up and I did what I was supposed to do. But I I, I wasn't going to take their money <laughs> regardless. I sort of like did, you know, finished the circle and was like, I don't need to talk to them anymore. They're gross. And I don't want to like go into too much more detail because I don't want this investor to know who they are. And I don't want them to realize that this is the story (laughs) that I tell, but it was not lovely. And it just speaks to the double standard. You know, as you're speaking, I'm thinking about women in the workplace, women in business, and we see that double standard every day with the boys club and the men's clubs. And we walk into that environment and it's enough to make you just want to turn right back around and go back from where you were coming from. So I think so many women, even though I have not had that experience and so many women, not necessarily that direct experience, but I think we've all experienced walking into the room, feeling uncomfortable, hearing the code, 
hearing the code words, you know, feeling like we're in a boys club and it can be very unsettling. And, you know, you just know, you know, who's going to get, you know, like the deal or who's going to get the promotion or who's going to get, you know, that opportunity. So, you know, Jesse, in that same article, you mentioned that investing in women represents a $3 trillion opportunity, which is unbelievable. Can you elaborate on the stat and what it means in terms of that opportunity? Yeah, I mean, this is a real opportunity. You know, this is an underserved opportunity and any underserved opportunity means bigger returns because there's less money going into them. So there's so much data around investing in women uh, now. But when I started, I mean, people thought I was crazy and they were like, oh, you're it's like, what a cute little niche. And, you know, I'd sort of be like, oh, well, how many deals did you see last year? And they'd be like, oh, I saw 300. And I'd be like, oh, cool. I saw 5,000. So, you know, we're in the business of seeing as many deals as possible. So just in terms of that conversation, we're winning. And um, I think, you know, it is a huge opportunity and you can look at it from so many angles. One, women raise half as much capital. They double the return. The data is now coming out that they exit a year earlier and they're more profitable. So those are all really positive things when you're an investor. And so it's going great. It's going great for us. It's going great for many others who are investing in this space, but we still need more capital. I need more capital as a fund. Any female manager needs more capital because we deploy and inevitably we will invest it in women and women invest in women typically more often than men. So I think we need more women with capital and we need more female founders taking the capital and making billion dollar returns and making a whole bunch of millionaires at the top of their business. Um, And then also women control the majority of the capital, which is ironic because they control the dollars spent and the consumer dollars. But it's very ironic because women don't typically control the pocketbooks in a household. And that's a major problem are taught to give away money before we are taught to grow it. And that's wrong. Learn to grow the money before you give it away. Like I understand, I think nonprofits are so important. They hold a very important place. They solve problems that can't be solved with for-profit businesses. And I give as much as I possibly can, but like learn to make money before you give it away. Like that, that just seems logical. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the biggest hurdles, one of the biggest for sure that women face and women entrepreneurs, you know, just sharing the stat on this McKinsey study that came out that women, I think over the next three to five years, you know, there's going to be a shift in assets to women to the tune of 30 trillion. And so absolutely, we need to learn how to grow it before we give it away. We need to have the right mindset when it comes to money, for sure. And so, Jesse, so many female entrepreneurs, especially Black women and women of color, have come on this podcast. And they've told me that initially they struggled in raising funding for their businesses. Why do women of color struggle so much to get this funding? I mean, you're in the VC world, too. So I know you're, you're closer than many of us will ever be. And how can we change this? You know, we've touched on a bit of it, you know, earlier in the podcast, but like, what do you think is the essence of the problem here? And and how can we change that? There's so many broken pieces of this problem. So one, yes, women and people of color specifically are much more, I think, just discriminated against in general when it comes to dollars. It's It's a problem. What we've found that's really positive is, you know, you have to pick your bucket for investment. You have to pick your thesis. You have to pick what you're going to invest in. And by saying our bucket is we're looking for women, we have over 50% minority-led companies. We look at companies from a diversity lens of age, race, and gender. We want to make sure each of our companies is representing that and we help them grow businesses from that stage, from the early stages thinking that way. And that's a beautiful thing. We really, you know, diversity breeds success. I believe that and the data proves it. So it's fantastic. But yeah, I have trouble raising and I know, you know, I come from a background that is, I feel I was very fortunate growing up and I have trouble raising and I have a track record. I've sold companies to Twitter, to Walmart, to P&G. And let me just tell you, the discrimination does not stop like, it doesn't matter where you come from. Women are much less, I don't know, it's like taken seriously, so many things. 
And I feel like I'm held to a completely different standard where I watch my peers who are male, who I love, who've never raised a fund before and are like, I think I'm going to start a VC fund. And this just happened to me. I had been courting this family office. It's a very well-known family office for almost two and a half funds. And then I was sitting next to one of the investors there at dinner and he said, oh yeah, we invested in this guy. And I said, wait, what? He just started a fund. He's never had no track record, zero. I said I was going to do this. I did it. I have returns and you're like, what's the problem here? And I think it's the problem is as you get into the bigger capital as well, you know, everybody looks the same. And also something I've, it's like a half-baked idea I've had recently, and I'm sure I'm going to alienate every single potential investor in my next fund, but there's 20 advisors who, and that's like an organization who manages people who have of high net worth or endowments or institutions. There's about 20 major advisors in the world the rest, there's others, there's like thousands and thousands, but the ones that manage the majority of the capital in the world, there's 20. So 20 organizations are making the decision for the majority of the capital and invested dollars in the world. So I have this like thought that the problem is diversity of thought at these 20 advisories. And what we need to do is somehow like throw a bomb into these advisories because what they do is they manage like, you know, $50 billion for one client and $10 billion for another client and in total $300 billion or whatever it is. But if we threw a bomb into that and said, if you have more than $4 billion, I think you can hire your own person to make these investment decisions. Then we would have much more diversity of thought, of location, because also all these advisors are typically on the East Coast in kind of like the New England territories. That's also a problem. It's in the same location, like they're all in the same locations. So I think we need to like break that up. And then that's broken in addition to they all invest in the same traditional venture capital funds that they've been investing in for years and years, and they don't disrupt that. They are not, they're also the least networked human beings on earth. I am a very well networked human being. I know many people, I'm meeting new people every day. You're a bad VC if you're not. And I am meeting thousands of people a year, truly. And like, I have trouble getting in touch with these people. That's ridiculous. Like if I can't get an introduction to them, if they won't take a cold email, they're in the business of doing deals and they're doing a bad job if you can't access their capital. And I tweeted something about this just to sort of like test the waters. And someone said, well, what do you think about like maybe, I mean, I see both sides, like they have to kind of sit on their pile of gold and everyone wants a piece of them if they have a pile of gold. And I'm like, yeah, but if you have a pile of gold, you better be doing good stuff with that gold. And in order to do good things with that gold, you need to meet as many people as you can and find the right places to do it as the other problem. So that's at the top. The other problem is the emerging managers problem. That these guys have all been investing the same capital into these same funds. Emerging managers are... There's tons of great female managers. There's tons of great funds that are focused on diversity and you know, African-American founders and Latinx founders. And there's like a whole diaspora of unique emerging managers right now. In addition to that, just like any emerging manager is having trouble. I've had these fund of funds. I'm a fund. I'm supposed to raise from fund of funds. Like <laughs> I'm supposed to raise from them. The first meeting I had with one fund of fund, they said, yeah, we want to get to know you for five to 10 years. I'm, so I'm not going to need you in five to 10 years. I hope I'm not going to need you in five to 10 years. And how can that be possible that you run an emerging managers program? If you are need to get to know me for five to 10 years, I won't be an emerging manager in five. That's broken. Also emerging managers programs are not actually emerging managers programs. And so we need more capital going to emerging managers and smaller, like fund to funds going to smaller funds, Um, And funds just starting out, there needs to be more capital there. So I think those are a couple of the problems. It's just like how the funds are broken down and how the capital is being dispersed. And I think you really need 
you know, I was mentioning how we went and said, hey, we're looking for women. That's off of the traditional Sand Hill Road, Silicon Valley, Stanford, Harvard track. And, you know, we don't discriminate. We have a few of those too, but we have like, you know, you want to give everyone a fair shot. And you also, you're going to miss the next Uber or what have you if you don't meet with everybody. And so we have that, but because we said, hey, we're looking for women, we broke up this network and you get this like really interesting network that's different. We're always meeting new people. We're meeting with new groups, new technology organizations because we're looking for something different. And it's not just like this. It's like the stuck pipeline. It's like that needs to just be disrupted at the top, at the bottom, the whole thing. So those are a couple of my perspectives on how we change all of these numbers. And I am working my butt off to do it. So if you guys, anyone out there listening, if you have other ideas, I mean, I'm doing my best to get as many women and people of color capital as possible. And I'm always looking for new pipelines, new opportunities, but we need money too to invest. And that's been our biggest. Yeah, no, for headache. sure. I can see that. And especially for women of color, like you spoke about, you know, these VCs not being adequately networked which is unbelievable because if we're looking at diversity, we're looking at women in their families who are probably the first to start this type of business, the first to start a business, the first to go to university, the first ever. Like it's, it's unbelievable the disparity and the gap in that funnel that exists because there's no way they can be captured in that traditional. So I honestly agree with you that that traditional model needs to be blown up. There's no way we can adequately capture you know, women of color who are in the pipeline, want to get in the pipeline. And there's just no way there's just a fundamental disconnect. Uh, It's just not there. And so, you know, Jesse, I'm just wondering, how can women gain the trust of investors? So women of color who are automatically dismissed by these investors. I mean, when you open your mouth, you know, people question, what are your qualifications? Where do you come from? How can these women gain the trust of these investors, especially women of color? Oh, such a good question. You know, I think with investors, I mean, some of the way we look at it is investors want to get to know you. So sometimes like they just need to see that you did what you said you were going to do. So sometimes we invest really quickly at our fund. And sometimes, sometimes I take a long time. And it's usually because I'm like, "Eh, I want to get to know this founder for a minute. And I'll tell them that I'll say, hey, keep me posted. It's not going to happen today. But then keep them posted, like never look at a no as like a flat out no, keep them posted. And so like those founders, I say, well, send me updates, you know, and they'll send me updates like every quarter or whatever it is. And then I'll invest the next year because they said, Hey, we're going to get to a million in revenue. And then they email me like two and a half months later. And they're like, so we got to a million in revenue. And then they say, we're going to do this. And then they do it. You know, it's just kind of like you need that timeline and it doesn't have to be like endless. Like that's a clear timeline. That's like, I just needed to like get to know them. And sometimes it's just sort of, they send me an update and they made great traction and I could tell that they were working. And I also think make sure and make it clear to these investors that, you know, this is an investment. Like the best thing you could do as a founder is like, not talk to me, like not even take my money. Like that's the best thing you could do because you would own 100% of your business if you bootstrapped it all the way and then you sell it for a billion dollars and then you're a billionaire and you get every dollar of that. You know, that's the best thing you could do. But most people don't have a million bucks in their back pocket to fundraise to like, you know, get their company off the ground. And, you know, the majority of humans don't have that. So you need to go raise when you're trying to grow your business. So if you know... Like I like to see that the founders are putting everything into this business and understand that taking a check from me, they have every single, like every bone in their body is like, I will make this back for you. I will make this back for you 10 times, a hundred times. I'm going to work so hard until I make this back. We have this founder um, who I talked to this morning, Joanna from Hop Skip Drive. And it's like an Uber type service or started as an Uber type service for families and childcare stay for transportation, but then they started working with the LA foster care system. And now they're in 10 cities across the country, work foster care system, making sure kids are getting to and from school. 
Anyway, you can imagine that COVID was not her best friend. You can imagine that every school shut down and it was not great. But Joanna is a force. I knew, like, I knew before, because you get to know these founders, that she would not lose my money. Like, I knew it. But watching what she did through COVID, like, she was just figuring it out. She's like, we're offering rides for childcare, for like healthcare providers, kids. We're, she just figured it out. Like you have to be open and malleable. And if your bank account is empty, you will figure out how to build it back up. And I think that's the best thing you can illustrate to an investor is like, this is not a gift. You do not get free money from me. Like you get an investment. I own a piece of your company and I expect you to make that back for me because I only make money if you sell this for a billion dollars. Like that's the way I make money and my investors make money and we all run a business here. So to say, hey, I'm going to take this from you. Thank you. And I'm going to work so hard. You're going to be so happy that you invested in me. In 10 years, I'm going to have returned this many, many times over by doing this, this, and this. Like I'm not saying have that exit plan because you might go public. You might do something else to make the money back. But I'm saying just know that's like you take a check. It's a 10 year journey and you need to make that back. So if you can figure out ways to illustrate that to an investor, I think that is the best thing you could do. And that's a great example. It's a real concrete example of a company, an entrepreneur who turned things around like really quickly, was able to pivot find additional sources of revenue in a really hard time when things got tough, which is, I think that's a great example, Jesse. So thank you so much for sharing that. And I know you, you know, you took the personal financial identity quiz that I developed, and that was based on my book, Holistic Wealth. And so many female entrepreneurs have been coming on the podcast. They've been sharing their stories, sharing their quiz results, and giving us insights on how it has impacted their investment and spending philosophy. As a VC and someone who invests in women-owned businesses, I'm so interested in your results and personal views on this. So Jesse, if you could just share your results with us and kind of your views around how you think the results are in terms of your spending and saving philosophy and just from your background, your unique vantage point as a VC and as a woman who invests in other women in terms of your personal financial identity, that would be great. Yeah, no, I took the test and I loved it. And everyone should take the test. It is very good and it helps you. Also, the cool thing you're doing with this show is talking about money. I think that's like so incredibly important. And I think for so long, it's been taboo, especially with women. And that's a problem. So we need to talk about it. We need to be a part of it. We need to be buying crypto. We need to be like in all those conversations. It's really important. But yes, I took it. I am a minimalist apparently, which we were discussing beforehand, but I was surprised it said I was a minimalist because I take so much risk with my capital, almost like I think most people would feel uncomfortable with how much risk I take because I'm like, I'll bet on that. That's going to be great. I've seen risk pay off and I've seen returns come from taking a bigger amount of risk because VC is the riskiest asset class. So I'm comfortable investing in three people who have an idea and seeing that blow up. That said, I've lost a lot of money finding those ideas. So you have to be comfortable with that. But I'm comfortable taking risk. I invest in a lot of cryptocurrency. I invest in the stock market. I invest in some real estate. But I think where it said I was a minimalist is like, I don't need a lot of stuff. Like, I don't need, like, I like love my leather jacket. I like will wear it every single day. You know, I have like a couple nice items that I really enjoy, but I don't need to spend. I don't need to shop all the time. Actually, when I go shopping, I'm sort of like, I feel like I go big time shopping like one time a year and just buy whatever I need. And then I just like don't. So I think that's probably where the minimalist comes from. I'm not like a huge consumer. Like I buy what I need. And it's usually like, I feel like I'm always on Amazon, but it's for like diapers and like wipes and things for my kids. So I guess I'm a minimalist in terms of that, but I like taking risk with my capital. Yeah, no. And those are some good insights as well, for sure. And I can identify with so much of that in terms of taking risks too, and with the minimalist aspect. And so Jesse, for female entrepreneurs, how important do you think it is for them to get to know their personal financial identity, especially in terms of growing and scaling their businesses? Because I'm sure you've seen entrepreneurs sometimes who just like splurge 
and possibly not know how to rein things in when things need to be tight. And so I just wanted to get your unique perspective on that in terms of how important this is in terms of growing and scaling a business, especially if you're looking for investments and investors. This is such a good question. We actually have a name for it. I call them fancy founders. They have not, they have not gone well for me, if I'm being completely honest. I can think of one that did go well, but we call them fancy founders and they just are very comfortable spending a lot of cash. And you'll come and sort of knock on their door regularly and say, we need to cut burn. 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 And then they run out of money and they're like, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, okay, well, I was telling you for, you know, two years, like that you should probably cut your spending, but you know, I'm not running the company. I'm doing the best I can to support you running the company and you should probably have listened. And that's a problem. I think the best thing you can do as a founder is spend nothing. There's some great stories like, the Skype founders raised all this money and never spent it. And then they sold to Microsoft. <laughs> like, yeah, like don't spend it. Like be profitable, focus on profitability first. And, you know, I think right now there's this huge shift happening because we have like the Ubers and the WeWorks and all these explosions of air is sort of what I call it. Like, it's like this explosion in valuation and no one was profitable and their numbers were not that good. They just sort of had a lot of money moving inside in a messy way. And you should focus on a healthy balance of profitability and growth. There are companies like social media companies and things of that nature that you need growth before there's any profitability. And that's, that's just a risk you have to be willing to take if you're that kind of founder. In terms of anything where you're selling a product, whether it's technology or a physical product, focus on profitability first. EBITDA, be EBITDA positive. Like that is your most important number. And then find a healthy balance of growth. Grow as you can. But I would much rather invest in my company that raised one and a half million dollars and is now doing 20 in revenue and may never have to raise again, then, you know, like, I think that is a great return for an investor, a great return for the founder. And then to get to the first part of the question you asked, which is like, what should these founders be thinking about in terms of spending? I was talking about spending within the business, you know, you should be spending like nothing, hire, pay your employees, you know, whatever you need at the business, but don't be like getting private jets and doing the whole thing. I think that's, like that would be bad if you weren't profitable and you were like flying on private jets everywhere. Like you can fly like the rest of us, you know, but I think there's also something to be said about a founder, which I think you were kind of getting to. And these female founders should also be thinking about how to set themselves up for success in the future. I have to say, I see more than with women, more than anything, like they'll be they won't realize, oh, I gave up so much equity in my business. So I only own like 9% of the business. And it's like, well, you can set that up better from the beginning because you'll make more on the other end and setting your employees up and making sure everybody has equity who deserves equity. Because if you're going to go sell your company for a billion dollars, you want to make a whole bunch of millionaires. Like you want to make a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of money who worked really hard. And that's how we, that is sort of, like entrepreneurs are the American dream and you can actually create many success stories within one. Like the coolest story is when Howard Schultz from Starbucks, like when he took Starbucks public, he decided he wanted every single employee, barista, et cetera, to own a piece of the company. And he gave everyone a stock. And there's this great story in his book onward, everyone should read. But when he took it public, everyone that he called it the beanstalk story. And everyone had these beanstalk stories where all of a sudden, every single person who worked at Starbucks made thousands to millions of dollars and they paid off loans and they went on vacations and they like bought a million dollar house. And they, it's just like, that's what entrepreneurs, I think that's a responsibility entrepreneurs have is set yourself up for success, but also your employees um, take care of everybody who works for you because you can't do anything alone. That's so true. And I think those insights are so good, Jesse. I think in terms of this show and the podcast, one of the best we've had so far from your perspective 
And when you spoke about the fancy founder and how those haven't really worked out, I thought, wow, that's amazing. Because I know instinctively, we all know intuitively that that would happen. But to hear it from your perspective really brings it home and really drives it home. And I think so many entrepreneurs should be listening into this to hear your perspective and your story. So, Jesse, it was amazing having you on the show. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing these stories and these concrete examples of entrepreneurs and how they've impacted the world and what they've done. It was amazing having you here. Thank you so much for having me and keep doing this and celebrating all sorts of women and money and make everyone take your test because it's really important. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us this week on Holistic Wealth with Keisha Blair. Make sure to visit our website, KeishaBlair.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or via RSS so you will never miss a show. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes or if you simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Are you a member of the Institute on Holistic Wealth? If not, what are you waiting for? Go to Institute on Holistic Wealth slash memberships to choose your membership plan and join. As a member, you get so many perks, free worksheets, advice, coaching, and a member's workshop to design an intentionally designed life. You need to figure out your life purpose? Take the Build Your Life Purpose Portfolio online self-paced course. You're struggling with all your money decisions? Take the free financial identities quiz and then take the course. You recently had a breakup, job loss, or experienced the death of a loved one? Take the holistic healing course. You need an overall plan to achieve holistic wealth? We will help you figure out your holistic wealth blueprint. And of course, if you want to start making money by helping others achieve holistic wealth, become a certified holistic wealth consultant. Regardless of what career you've got, the Institute will show you how to increase your income and walk in your personal purpose. The sooner you join, the sooner you start to achieve a more holistically wealthy lifestyle. And you're going to want to stay for a very long time. So go to Institute on Holistic Wealth slash memberships to join. If you haven't read the book yet, pick up a copy of the award-winning, best-selling Holistic Wealth 32 Life Lessons to help you find purpose, prosperity, and happiness. 